Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian Smith back with another episode of Grief to Growth, and I've got with me today a really fascinating guest. I can't wait to get into this conversation. Her name is Bridget Finclair. And she is, I'm going to read her bio, and I've got literally six pages of notes to talk to her about. So I don't know how much we're going to get through, but I feel like we're kind of like-minded souls. Everything that she sent me, I'm really interested in. But she's an author, a spiritual teacher with almost 30 years of experience. She's qualified and experienced psychotherapist, hypnotherapist, and healer. She was a professional therapist in London's Harley Street. She left England in 2012 for Cape Town, where she now lives with her South African husband. She loves teaching, writing, and speaking, and weaving together the threads of her spiritual and professional journeys, she designed the Bone Circle, which is a unique, transformative, and life-changing program that ties together three significant areas of expertise, intuition and creation, the sacred and the metaphysical, and therapy and healing. Bridget has facilitated and taught many courses, including meditation, healing, dowsing, sacred geometry, and space clearing. She's also facilitated a Course in Miracles, created Truth Yoga, a return to yoga as a spiritual practice, and Freedom Dance, which is a free-form conscious shamanic trance dance. She currently facilitates a study group for the Book of Knowledge, the Keys of Enoch, um, and Bridget's intention is to awaken people to a higher purpose and a more joyful and harmonious life. She does this through creating awareness, providing a higher path of consciousness, teaching how to tap into intuitive wisdom, and setting up support groups that can work together powerfully to create positive change. Her favorite saying is an African one, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. She believes we need to go together in supporting a new evolution in consciousness. And Bridget has just finished a new book, which is coming out, I think, the end of July in England and beginning of August in America, and it's called Red Dress. I'm sure we'll talk about that, that novel, which I guess covers a lot of the themes of Bridget's work. So with that, I want to welcome to Grief to Growth, Bridget from Claire. Thank you very much, Brian. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm really honored to be a guest and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, yeah, and as, as I was saying, your publicist sent me like six pages of notes. He said, pick a few topics that are, are interesting to you, but they're all interesting to me. And it's really, <laughs> you know, you've done psychotherapy, um, you've done hypnotherapy, and, and somewhere in here talked about past life regressions. I just did a past life regression session a couple of weeks ago for the first time ever and between lives. And you talked about A Course in Miracles. Um, I just spoke to the Circle of Atonement group a couple of weeks ago. So there's, there's a lot of overlap in our, in our, in our lives and our interests. I'm not exactly sure even where to start, but tell me more about yourself and how you got into all of this. Oh my goodness, there's a story and a half. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I think people who've been on a spiritual journey, it's very difficult to pinpoint where it started sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know for some people there's been some kind of big challenge in their lives and that's what sort of shook them up and made them follow a spiritual path. But there wasn't necessarily like that for me. Um, but when I look back on my life, there's probably lots of things that were signposts that there were there right from the beginning of my life. Um, I had a little imaginary friend when I was a child and then I kind of just was told that would be ridiculous, but it's probably I was channeling something at the time, but I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the real journey started when I had children. So I, I had my daughter when I was 30, she was in 1992. And I think when you become a parent, you, you start to see a new perspective on life because it's not just about you anymore, is it? And uh, you got, you, I felt this tremendous responsibility to bring this being into the world. I then went on to have a son as well, two years later. Mm -hmm. And that made me look at myself and say, how do I want to parent my kids? And I think that was the first, real step in consciously looking at who am I, what am I here to do, and there must be more to life. I'd had touches upon that earlier in my life with 
difficult relationships where I would self reflect, is this me or is this them? And, you know, trying to untangle things. And I think sometimes you can go into the psyche and it can be what I call a hall of mirrors. You know, when you go into uh, a fairground and you go into the hall of mirrors and the mirrors are all very, um, waving and they're distorting mm -hmm. and sometimes you can go into the mind and it's very very distorting um so once i'd had my daughter i actually went and had therapy because i just felt everything was so distorted inside me i couldn't work out what was true and what was not so i guess that really started my journey um, and all the way along was this spiritual path as well and it it's step by step by step with me i, I feel some people they kind of go on the elevator of spiritual journey and something happens to them and they, they have some amazing awakening and they go straight to the top and boom, they're awake. And other people, it's a slow, slow journey. And for me, it's been one of those ones that's been a slow, slow journey, but it's gathered momentum hugely, mm. um, probably in the last sort of 20, 25 years, it's really gathered momentum. And in the last 10 years since I've been, well, nine years I've been in South Africa, um, because I haven't been dealing with clients as a psychotherapist, I've had more time to write and to um, teach and to study and to really, really grow. And it's my belief that the more that we become aware and more we raise our consciousness, the more we understand and read and self-reflect and all these wonderful tools that we have now, mm -hmm. then we're letting go slowly of past layerings, past traumas. We're letting go of that stuff. And that for me is the ego, the conditioning. Um, and you're letting go of that. And the more you let go of that, the more you're allowing your true luminous self to come through and guide you, which is that conscious being that we are, yeah. this wonderful, you know, greater self that I would call greater self. Yeah, ab absolutely wonderful. And you know, it's interesting. I had a guest on the other day and I was saying that when I ask people to tell their stories, there's almost always some turning point. A lot of times it is tragic, but it doesn't have to be. And with you, it was, it was the birth of your daughter. And I'd say that was one of the turning points in, in my life also when my, when my first daughter was born. It just really, as a parent, you just start to look at the whole world differently. Um, and, it, and it changes you know, pretty much everything. Let's talk about consciousness because, you know, I think for you and I both, as after I was reading the notes that I got from your publicist, we both agree that consciousness is like what it's all about. So what is consciousness to you and, and why is it so important? Why is it the key? Oh gosh, what a huge and wonderful question. Um, consciousness is, is more than just, I mean, I think, let's just say what it's not, not rather than then we can maybe go into what it is. Mm -hmm. Cause I think sometimes people think consciousness is, um, you, the fact that we're alive um you know we can say that somebody's been knocked unconscious in the ring you know right. in a boxing match uh, or that you're unconscious when you're on the operating theater so therefore when you're uh, alive and well and going around your business you're conscious but that's not what i mean that's just a flow of sodium ions in your brain that are, that are keeping you alive but that's not what i mean by consciousness and i think that's the same for you as well for what i mean by consciousness is awakening and becoming aware of more than your five senses, of becoming aware of more than that treadmill life that we're kind of conditioned to live. Because I feel like it, it, humanity is a little bit of a sausage machine. You know, we, we're born and then we're expected to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, we're expected to have certain beliefs and there's the, we're having um, our, the, the thoughts and beliefs and conditioning of our own parents, of our religion, of our country, of our color, of our race, of our creed and all, and, and the, the time that we're born in and all of these things are impinging upon us and molding that, that small child mind that's mm. taking it all on. And these become these conditioned responses that we're not even aware of. And it's, it's for me, it's we're asleep. We're asleep to true reality. We're asleep to the moment. We're asleep to the beauty, actually, of creation. Mm. And we're asleep to all these things that are, I would say are unseen. Um, so, you know, past lives, for example, between lives, spirit guides, angels, angelics, um, spiritual uh, awakening. Um, the, the, uh, for me, spiritual means filled with the spirit. That's mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. That's for me, the presence of the divine. Um, and so to become aware of that, I, I, in my life, I come across people who don't even believe there's anything happens at the end of their life. They think they die and that's it. And for me, I heard you say in, in the interview, like, absolutely completely on the same song sheet as you. For me, death is not a death, it's a rebirth into something wonderful. 
It's just mm -hmm. the soul going into its next container, if you like. It's going into its next incarnation, not as a physical, but into another space. It's a mm -hmm. rebirthing into something glorious. So, but we, I meet people who just think that this, you know, this life is that it, it that is existential. We die and we're gone. And I don't believe that's true. And I meet people who just think uh, everything is everything is with the rational mind. It has to be provable. It has to be peer reviewed. It has to be something that they can count and quantify. And for me, consciousness goes way beyond that. We go into the spiritual mind. We go into the intuitive mind. We're connected actually to a greater mind because I believe that our minds are almost like um, terminals of a computer on a greater mind. And what we tap into, we can tap into all kinds of incredible things, but we have to be still and get rid of, empty out a little bit of the, of the rubbish to be able to do that. So for me, it's an awakening and it's an awareness. And I think once you become aware, for example, that everything is one, everything is connected at the level of consciousness, that we are pure consciousness beings, then why would you go hurt somebody? You know, we live in a culture where there's a lot of war, there's a lot of crime, there's a lot of violence. Why? Because we feel separated, cut off, asleep. We're not aware. So for me, consciousness is the key to the evolution of humanity. Because if we were all consciously aware of who we really are and what we're here to do and that we're not alone and that there is a vast cosmology out there mm -hmm. with um, a whole hierarchy or holarchy of divinity out there and that we have purpose and that the challenges in life are there for us to grow. This is schoolhouse earth. And if we all have that awareness and we were all here to support each other and really understood that what I do to you, I'm doing to myself. And when I get angry, I'm just projecting something from inside of myself and to work on ourselves and become conscious. I think that would just change humanity. If you look at the problems of the world, it really takes consciousness to rise above them. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Sorry, long waffling answer, but well, it's a, such it's a, a big subject. It's it's a big question. And, and I've kind of evolved to the point of similar to what you said. To, to, I look at everything as, and, and all these things I read different things, they're all kind of saying the same thing, but Paul Tillich called God the ground of all being. And yes. I, I view that that's consciousness. And, and uh, there's a guy interviewed on my show, Dr. Bernardo Castro, that has a, a concept promotes a kind of called idealism, which says that consciousness is pretty much everything and the material arises out of that. So once we start to understand that, that consciousness is everything, then it, it just creates, like you said, that greater cosmology, that bigger picture, and that we are literally all one. It's not just a figure of speech, but we are all part of this greater consciousness. There's one mind. And then we are little nodes, as you said, we're little nodes that we we individuate, but we're still connected, and we and we we walk around thinking that we're separate when we're we're not, and we could not exist without each other. Totally, I totally agree with you, and I think consciousness to me is life. Um, and at the quantum level, we really are connected, and at the consciousness level, we are connected. Mm -hmm. And we know that matter. We know this from quantum physics. This is where spirituality meets meets science. We know from quantum mechanics and quantum physics um, that everything is connected. Um, that everything comes from a waveform before it becomes a particle, for them to come from light, actually, from photons. So we're seeing that there's so much more that, that we don't understand. And well, how fascinating to try and dip into that and, and understand it. Uh, when you talked about the, the ground of, be, of all being, um, I, I agree with you. I think, for me, the ground state of all being is love which mm -hmm. encompasses mm -hmm. consciousness and mm -hmm. light mm -hmm. and intelligence. Um, and that obviously goes beyond our earthly understanding of love. I think there's more for us to understand as we continue to grow. Yeah. Which is and why that's, I always say love is the way. That's my. Yeah. And, and it's so funny. It sounds so hippie-ish, but that's what every near-death experience you come back, comes back and tell us. It's, it's all about love. It's all about love. It's, it's all love. And these are synonyms, you know, consciousness, love, source, God, you know, ground of being. These are just words that we use to try to express something that's really, you know, inexpressible. Um, another, th another thing you said, I thought was really, really interesting. You said we live in a duality. And we said, you said we are a greater self, and we have a smaller self. Could you expand on that? I think that's, that's brilliant. Yeah, so um, 
interestingly, I, I'm just I'm going to backtrack to give a bit of background to how I get to where that yeah, is. Um, so I didn't. I grew up in England, and I didn't grow up in a religious family at all. I mean, I think most Church of England English people are not very religious. They just go to church for weddings and funerals. Right. So. In a way, that was a massive blessing for me because I didn't have that indoctrination of a religion, you know, the dogma of a religion. So having now gone on this huge spiritual journey, I'm able to come back to scripture, um, you know, the Bible, but also Eastern scriptures. And I'm able to come back to scripture with a spiritual mind and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So and I've kind of dipped into Kabbalah and Eastern scripture and, and the Bible as well and other teachings like the Nag Hammadi and all sorts of things. And it always, in go back to when we talk about duality the garden of eden where adam and eve are in the garden and there's all these different trees and it's a metaphor for the trees of life the kabbalistic trees of life which have these sephirotic emanations which are divine um, personality or divine aspects if you like mm -hmm. right. a better word. and they choose to eat from the tree of good and evil not the tree of life so they, they go into, now there are many, many, many trees of creation, and they go into the tree of good and evil. Now, good and evil is already a duality now. We're in black and white, good and evil, right and wrong, you know. And it, everything in our life has this polarity in, in this system of things where we live. I don't say that that's there in the greater cosmos, because I think it's only our local universe which is in that sort of duality mm -hmm. um but that's that's what it means hot and cold um up and down east and west north and south but of course that duality is, um, or polarity creates a lot of friction in life and it creates a lot of arguments so we can see that playing out so hugely in the world right now where really we need to, need to reunite and realize we're one and work together but then now mm -hmm. people are against each other though should we have the vaccine or not and is it this or that and conspiracy or not and there's all these kind of dualities that are playing out and in amongst that what i would say is that we're actually conflicted beings because we ourselves are also have this dual nature and i think when we're born and before we awaken and before we have any kind of uh, awakening experience or any kind of spiritual journey whatever that is we believe that we are the small self and for me the small self is the one that as i said is conditioned in childhood now look that's going to be different for different people some people had a wonderful childhood and their conditioning is going to be less harmful shall we say um, than somebody say you had horrific childhood so and then there's also resilience and what the, there's so many factors that we're unaware of but for everybody's experience is different but at the end of the day even if you had a fabulous childhood you will still be conditioned and so we it's like laying down programs in a computer you know, the, the mind of the child is completely wide open till about the age of five. Now they're actually saying now maybe seven in an alpha, the alpha brainwave state, which is a learning programming state. Mm -hmm. We kind of know this even from Freud, you said, you know, five years, first five years. So, um, and now we know even more about that with neuroscience. So in those first five years of life, all of these things, we're basically learning how to survive. We're learning how to please the people that will look after us so that we're, we're, um, viable we're learning how to fit in with society how to fit in at school how to fit in with our culture and we're learning the ropes and we're learning it from the people that went before us and that's laid down just like putting programs on your computer or putting apps on your phone they're just yeah. there and we don't even question them they're just there and we run them and i don't think people understand how deeply conditioned we are now that conditioning as i said it can be um really detrimental people can be in horrible trauma and that really stifles them for their life until they've been able to heal that trauma and overcome it and move forward and i think actually a spiritual path is a very powerful way to do that because you'll be guided by a higher mind um but yeah so the, your, your, the duality is that you have this smaller self now even in someone who's had a wonderful upbringing we often find these kind of negative beliefs that play out most of humanity get focused on negative beliefs now the reason for that if we look at the psychology of it is that our subconscious mind is there to keep us safe and to help make sure that we 
stay alive. It's not there to make us thrive, it's there for us to survive. Mm -hmm. And survival goes into the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So babies are all born with a fear of falling and a fear of loud noises. Now, when we have that fear that kicks in, whatever it is, we'll go into either fight, flight or freeze. That's the only three things that we're wired to do in that small self. And mm -hmm. that creates, so if it's fight, it's anger. If it's flight, it's fear. And if it's freeze, it's actually you're giving your power away to somebody else and hoping something else will protect you. And at that point, you're not in your power and that leads to depression. So mm -hmm. these are the three kind of core negative values. But uh, emotions, sorry, and out of that stem all the other things. So if you're mildly frustrated, it's actually a form of anger. Mm. And those are the emotions that come from the small self when the ground state of being, which is love, and all the wonderful things come from that, like joy and peace and uh, all of those things, happiness, when that's blocked and it's blocked by this survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. So people then can wind up thinking, well, I'm not good enough to do this, or I don't really belong, or I'm not, I haven't got the power to do it, or I can't, I'm not allowed to do that because somebody will tell me off, or who am I to do this, little old me, um, I'm insignificant. And there's, I actually work with 12 key core beliefs that everybody has at varying degrees. Mm -hmm. And those things run the show often. So a lot of times people want to do something and the small self goes, oh, but you can't do that. And it's often like in mum's voice or dad's voice or Uncle Joe's voice or something, you know, or your teacher's voice. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. And um, and that stops us and it keeps us limited. And it really goes back into what we were saying about consciousness, because I think as you become more consciously aware, you become aware of your own conditioning and you become aware of the voice that goes, you can't do that, for right. example. And then you go, well, actually, let's question this. Who's saying I can't do this? Um, and in stillness, I think in meditation is important and prayer, uh, any kind of stillness, in stillness, in nature as well, those sorts of things, we're able to bypass that conditioned mind and catch glimpses of a taste of honey. We catch glimpses of the intuitive mind. We catch glimpses of glory and beauty and we can look at a sunset or a, a rainbow or a waterfall and or a child at play and see fully present in that moment, just the absolute beauty and perfection of creation. And when we're doing that, we're tapping into something more. And I think that we each of us are also, as well as the conditioning that we get in early childhood, we're also born with gifts, talents and skills and passions. And those are part of our greater self. And mm -hmm. where these, and interesting you talked earlier about near-death experience because most people who have near-death experience say that they're large and luminous and huge and they can't imagine fitting back into their tiny body. Right, right. And that they can see 360 degrees and they can, they can be anywhere at any time and they see how beautiful they are, how enormous they are, how incredible they are at that level. And all that this body is, is our little earth suit. It's our container that we're in. And... So my belief is that we are that bigger self, that greater self. We are our gifts and talents and skills and passions and what we've come here to do and be and who we are and what we've come here to learn. That's who we really are. And then we have this small self. And the reason we have a small self is, it's the small self that's actually the suit, isn't it? It's the small self that, say, knows how to work the, work the keyboard to type the book. Right, or, right. You know, <laughs> but it's the greater self that will write the book. It's the greater self that inspires you to write the book. Uh, when Mike, I read dress, um, but it's my little self here that had to actually sit there at the typewriter and type red dress. So yeah. this is how normally people just think that they're the small self and they forget the greater self. Or sometimes if they're aware of a greater self, they think I am a small self and I've got a greater self and it's up there somewhere and it's completely detached from me. And what I'm saying is, no, you are this bit but you have this bit, and when you understand that, they, those two parts of you, rather than being in conflict in this duality, you need to do this, no, I can't, can actually work together in synergy. Yeah, yeah, that was that was so well put. You know, and I did grow up with the religious background, and you, you're kind of taught that I am a body and I have a soul. And that so when I when I die, my soul is either gonna go to heaven or hell, but my soul is something that's separate. And, and that's the way I think most people we either think we're just a body, which is the materials point of view, or I am a body and I have a spirit, as opposed to I am a spirit and I have a body. And the, and the term I, I've come to use lately is I call this an avatar. 
So yeah. this is like, this is like a virtual reality. And my, my greater self is actually manipulating this. And I, I always, every time I get in this conversation, I always have to put in a plug for the ego because the ego is, gets such a hard time by spiritual people. We have to kill the ego. The ego is a terrible thing. I need, I need to destroy my ego. The ego is here to keep us in the avatar. The ego is here to keep the avatar safe and the ego. We need to have the ego serve that greater self. The ego should be in our service as opposed to being in control. And, and once we understand this duality, if you want to call it a duality, once we understand that, yeah, we're, this body is, this is important and we got to take care of it. And we, and that's what the ego's job is to do. And I, and I've heard people say, Oh, you know, I shouldn't fear this. I shouldn't feel this way. Well, it's actually, you, you know, you said it was kind of functional, but it's also biological. It's evolutionary because we look for the negative because that's our, our caveman saying, we got to look out for the saber tooth tiger. You know, we, we've got to, we've got to look out for danger. So we're biologically pre-programmed for that. So it's not a bad thing, but we just have to learn to get control of it. So I, I love the way you, you talked about that. And I really hope people can grasp that concept because I think it's like the key to really living a, an integrated life between our ego and our greater self. You know, I totally agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. And I feel like the ego is our vehicle of orientation. It's the ego that keeps us safe and that keeps us going. And it's this small body that actually has to do the work at the end of the day. We've, we've volunteered as well at the soul level. We chose to come into this life and we chose the parents we had and we chose the major traumas and we chose them to learn and grow at soul level. So yeah, absolutely agree, agree with you. Um, and also remember, you know, we do need to look after our body because it's the temple of the soul. It's the container that we've got right now. It's like having a car. You know, you're not going to let your car rust on your driveway. You're going to look after it and polish it and clean it and put petrol in it and have it serviced because you want to keep it going. And it's the same with our bodies. We should honor those. And I just want to pick up on what you were saying about the feelings. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think, oh, we've got to get rid of all these negative feelings. But you're never going to get rid of the negative feelings. And that's not what I teach. What I teach is it's natural and normal to have all those negative feelings they are part of our survival they are part of our program it's not to beat ourselves up or feel guilty or shameful that we got them it's to mm -hmm. just become aware that they're not always a true north they're not always a true reflection of reality because sometimes we can panic can't we can panic that oh somebody's gonna you know gonna, i'm gonna i'm gonna fail at that interview with brian you know something like that you know mm -hmm. like, oh my goodness he might just be grilling me and oh, we can have those thoughts everybody i'm sure can relate to those kinds of thoughts and just using that as an example sure. but it's not about getting rid of those thoughts it's about going yeah yeah it's almost like a child isn't it who's asking for a biscuit constantly and then if oh sorry you don't say the cookie you know in america you know, mm -hmm. asking for a cookie and you you've got to acknowledge that child and either say yes you can have one later or yes here it is or no you can't have a cookie they're bad for you but if you if you ignore the child it keeps going can I have a cookie can I have a cookie can I have a cookie and the mind is a bit like that and you can't just ignore those feelings you, you've got to listen to them and you've got to go okay i acknowledge that's there yeah. i acknowledge that this is going on for you and it's true for you and it's real for you but i'm just here to tell you, you you've got this it's okay and you don't have to act on that fear right but, and you can choose to have a different thought you can choose to say yeah of course you know i'm scared about whatever it is i'm worried about whatever it is um and, and that's okay and i acknowledge that and i hear you and i understand why but hey we've got a greater self and hey there's we can choose to acknowledge that and then choose something different choose to believe something different choose to enjoy this interview because we've got lots of things in common and it's going to be great fun and it's yeah. always a choice yeah, and, and, and that's the thing when we're operating from the ego, from the pre-programmed things un, sub, up, con, unconsciously, then we don't realize we have a choice. And so what are, what are some ways that we can learn to, to realize that we have a choice, to start to learn to choose our thoughts, to choose, you know, and, and, and to recognize, okay, this emotion, I know I have it, but it's not reflecting reality. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, 
If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to grief to growth. So how do, how do I get to that point? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, it goes back to consciousness, doesn't it? It goes back to consciousness and awareness because most people get caught in the, the, the turmoil of their feeling and thought. So they're angry or they're afraid and that's it. They, they don't consider that they might be mistaken on something or that it might be generated from inside of themselves. Oh. Often I see this, I used to see this a lot when I was a, a therapist with clients, that they'd be angry about something that somebody else had said to them. And then you kind of have to unpack that and stop and go, stop, hang on a minute. And so I think the only people way that people can begin to even start on that journey of realizing there's a choice is to first of all become aware of what they're thinking and feeling. That's the very first thing, to become aware. I'm angry. I'm angry because somebody said something that's upset me, say, for example. And then you've got to stop and kind of take some time out for a reflection and go, it's okay to be angry. I don't need to bury that or, you know, uh, deny it. It's okay to be angry, but what am I angry about? Why am I angry? Well, because she said X. You know, well, why did that make me angry? Dig a bit deeper. Why did that make me angry? Well, because da da da. And you'll always, it always goes back to something. It's never to do with what that person said in this moment now. It's always to do with something from the past. And then you can uncover it a little bit. So the first thing is becoming aware. And that's really self reflection, self inquiry. Um, and, you know, if it's too strong, because I know a lot of people have been through trauma and those emotions are way too powerful for them to stop and go, what's happening? Because they're going into amygdala hijack, mm. um, where the reptilian brain has basically taken over. Um, and it's very, very difficult and challenging. And that's the point where um, I would say, you know, think about working with someone that you trust and that you like, um, with a technique that you like, um, to start working through that. And mm. do you know what? We don't have to kind of go into old school psychotherapy and talking and all of that stuff now because we've got fabulous 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 techniques nowadays mm -hmm. um you know nlp hypnosis endr eft the tapping i mean there's so much out there that we can work with quickly to mm -hmm. just release trauma from the past so we can go okay that was a trauma it's really horrible um i've now processed it because the trauma's held in the whole of the nervous system. So mm. uh, you, you get triggered by things. So you've got to process that trauma so you can put it to bed. Then you, when things come up, you're able to kind of stand and go, okay, what's happening for me? And be curious or work with things or go for a walk. Movement's great. That's why I love the conscious dance and yoga. But you know, even just walking, walking in nature, if you're feeling really angry or really upset or really um, uh, afraid about something, you go for a walk in nature and you, you start just to start moving and walking and your mind will start processing it so it's always comes back to awareness become aware when you become aware of what's happening then you've got choice if you're not aware you've got no choice because you're being run yeah exactly and I, it's something that, that i found really works uh, and i know people sometimes really bristle at the word is meditation or mindfulness you know just sitting and and becoming really aware of your thoughts and and realizing that you can choose thoughts, you know, just like, okay, here's a thought, I'm going to choose not to have that. And it's like, oh, wow, I can do that. Because we not only do we think we're our bodies and our egos, we also think we're our thoughts. And we literally don't realize until we practice this, this mindfulness that, yeah, I can choose my thoughts, which therefore start to kind of help influence my our emotions. And, you know, when I learned that anger is a is a part of fear that that it's literally like, I feel like I'm being attacked. So now when I start to feel anger, I'm like, why am I fearful? What is it? And it's my ego. It's my ego saying, you're making me feel less than, and no one, no one can make me feel that way. I'm choosing that. And then I can choose not to be angry. Um, so it's, it's, it's really cool. Once you, once you start to put all this stuff together and it, and it, it starts with just knowing the kind of the cosmology or how we're, how we're made. 
Absolutely, completely agree with you. Um, and with the buttons are on the inside, aren't they? If somebody's pushed your buttons, they're on. Exactly. They don't, you don't go, go around with buttons all over you. You know, the buttons are on the inside. Um, meditation as well. And I think that's probably the single most powerful tool that anybody can take up. I've been meditating for about tw 21 years. I think I started, I read a book about meditation in 1999. I started seriously in 2000. So, and we're now wow. 2021. So 21 years of meditation. Mm -hmm. I could not have gone through the things that I've gone through without that practice. Um, it's such a powerful thing. It, I mean, it's one of those ones, isn't it? It's simple. I'll oh, just sit there and don't think of anything. Um, it's, it's an easy concept. It's difficult to do, but mm -hmm. of course it's difficult to do. Otherwise we'd all be meditating all the time. And the point is you practice just the same as when you go to the gym and you practice with your press ups or you practice your yoga posture or whatever it is you're practicing swimming. I don't know, whatever you do, you know, you practice it, play the violin. Um, you don't want to play the violin perfectly first time. And it's the same with meditation. It's a practice. It's a practice and a discipline. But wow, I think that the payoff and the results of that, the rewards of that practice are huge in so many ways. And that's one of them is to become aware of your own thoughts. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah, I for me, I've been I've been practicing meditation seriously now for probably about six or seven years. And um, for the last four years, I, I meditated every day, I meditate every day. And I tell people it's kind of like, it's like brushing your teeth, you don't skip a day of brushing your teeth, you it's it's, it's training your mind. Um, and it can it, it pays off in ways that you know, it takes a while. It's like, it doesn't happen at once. It's like, it's like going to the gym though, right? When you first go to the gym, you don't come out and you're super strong, you know, the first day, but it, it, it builds up over time. So, um, it's really, like I said, for people, when I, when I, and I, I noticed in the notes, you also said there are people want quick fixes and, you know, the books that really sell are the self-help books are like 30 days to a better you or seven days to a better you or how to whatever in three minutes. You know, but the, the thing is that word keeps coming up over and over again, practice, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of discipline. Discipline and practice, absolutely yeah. discipline and practice. And yeah, the, the meditation is a slow burn. It's not like you're going to see re results straight away, but actually I think people do feel less stressed pretty soon on, you know, in yes. a month or so. Mm -hmm. um, but keep going because it's just, it is amazing. It's, it's actually something that I put in the in Red Dress when I wrote that, that the, the character in there, Katie, meditates. And I even actually say in there how she meditates because everything in red dress is real. So if people want to just learn a very, very simple meditation, can read a novel and learn from it. So there's a lot of things she does um, that, that are great practices. And um, we're just seeing inside her mind. She's doing it for us so that we can, we can follow and learn along. And meditation is one of those key things, yeah. And we've been talking a lot um, kind of rashly. Um, but I, you had, you have a quote here from Einstein, which I hadn't heard before. And I, and I love it. And I have to start off by saying, I am a, I'm a, by nature, a rational person. My, my degrees in chemical engineering. Um, I, I looked at the universe as you know, mechanical deterministic and I, and I'm coming to this understanding about intuition and how magical everything really is. And I love this quote. Uh, Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. So could you expand on that quote and why you like that? I just think it's fabulous that somebody like Einstein, who, you know, we all think of Einstein as being this incredibly brainy person who's, you know, physician, physicist, sorry, um, mathematician, um, you know, scientist. And so we don't think about him talking about the intuitive mind, but actually he was highly intuitive. Um, I think he had another quote, actually, it's reminding me of it, something like, um, you know, some knowledge is something like 2% knowledge and 98% inspiration. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he was known to meditate towards the end of his life. And um, I think that's how he became so hugely successful um, because he did use the intuitive mind. Um, interesting that you're saying that you kind of had a rational um, background. And my father was an engineer and I grew up with four brothers and they're all very, very uh, rational. So of course I'm just the silly little girl who doesn't know anything. I'm the one who had the wacky intuitive mm -hmm. mind. But, mm -hmm. And I tried to suppress that for a long time and be mm -hmm. very rational. Um, but I think the secret really is we need both. It's again, it's a little bit like when we talked about greater self and small self. 
We need both. We need to have a rational, logical mind as well to understand how things work, to be organized in life, for, to remember to get on the podcast, you know, and to remember to uh, make sure that the earphones work and you know how to use Zoom and all these things. I've go, got to go shopping to get some food and I know how and I need to put petrol in my car and um, I need to schedule things. And so we do need a rational mind. And I think now we do need to also have an inquiring mind and not just accept things, particularly with. Uh, the, the times we're living in, we're living in very, very interesting times, a real opportunity in these times. But mm -hmm. we have to sit and think for ourselves because there's a lot of fake news going on on both sides of the fence. So we have to really kind of like um, unpack things and use the rational mind. Of course, we need the rational mind, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. And we've gone with, and this is what Einstein's saying, um, that we, we've created a society that thinks that rational mind is the be all and end all. So even if we're looking now, you know, somebody's more likely to believe a peer reviewed paper about mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. than somebody who gets an intuitive hit about something. Now, the problem with peer reviewed papers is it means all of your peers all agree to the same thing. So you've all come to the same conclusion. Well, by the time you've gone down that road to come to that same conclusion, you're very much channeled into or um, deeply ingrained into mm. the the rational mind and it doesn't leave any space for insights and inspiration to come in because that's what the intuitive mind does the intuitive mind is creative inspiring it has ideas it fits things together it's expansive it's uh um it, I think it's the intuitive mind that is also the spiritual mind that does connect to that higher consciousness and that higher mind. It's the intuitive mind that brings you inspiration when you've been meditating or allows you to see the workings of your own mind. Eckhart Tolle talks about this and he realizes the I am depressed. There must be another I looking at the I. So there's that observing witness, right. which is part of that intuitive mind. And I think that we, we have, as with everything, we have to get everything in balance and get it to work together. So just the same as you've got a greater self and a smaller self and you have to get them to work together, it's the same with the rational mind and the intuitive mind. You yeah. need the intuitive mind in balance with the rational mind. And when you've got that left and right brain, uh, the intuitive and the rational in perfect balance, you're in balance between head and heart, you're in balance, and then the greater gift comes in, which is the gift of spirit, which awakens us. Yeah. So it, it is such a powerful thing because I think we've gone into a, really, even since Einstein said that quote, we've gone further and further and further into a society that values the rational and dismisses and belittles the sacred gift of the intuitive mind. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And it's, it's interesting because as I've studied those scientists around Einstein's time, Einstein, Tesla, Max Planck, those guys, Borg, uh, not Borg, uh, Heisenberg, they, it was in, it was intuition that led them to these big leaps in knowledge. And then they worked out the, the details behind it. And they looked for beauty in nature. They looked for simplicity. They looked for balance. And, and, and when, when man first started developing the scientific method, it was because we believed in a rational universe. We believed a rational guy would create a rational universe. So we thought these things could be found out. And then we went so far down that rabbit hole that we, we, we threw out the whole idea of God or creator or source, whatever word you want to use, and said it's all about the material. But these guys that made these huge breakthroughs, like, you know, 100, 200 years ago, they were still very, in, they were still very intuitive. And you mentioned earlier that we value peer review papers over, over um, intuition. I go even farther. We value that over our own experience. We can have an experience of the divine. And then we'll dismiss it because we'll say it's not possible. We'll we'll get a sign, or we'll have we'll even have a vision or something, and we'll say, well, that was just my, that was just my imagination. That was just wishful thinking. Or people like yourself or myself, people will say, well, they're woo woo. You know, they're they're really out there. They're they're not they're not rational people. Which I believe that intuition actually goes beyond rationality. It's not it's not irrational. It's not subrational. It's actually super rational. It goes beyond what we can understand with our minds. And when people talk, when science now tells us, well, for example, time is an illusion. There is no time. That makes no sense to me rationally. It's like I, I experience time every day, but th that's where they're telling that's beyond what I can imagine. And where they talk about different dimensions, third, fourth dimension, fifth dimension, um, there are theoretically 11 dimensions. You know, we, our minds can't even grasp that. 
So the rational only takes us so far, I guess is my point. It only takes us to a certain point, and then we've got to take a leap of faith uh, and understand that there's something beyond the rational. Completely. I completely agree with you. And even if you go back further with science, if you go back to Newton, who discovered gravity, when mm -hmm. did he discover it? When he was sitting under a tree and the apple fell. You know, when he's in a contemplative space, in his um, intuitive mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I like how you said it's like the super rational. For me, it's like almost like super consciousness. Mm -hmm. The, the, the uh, intuitive mind is like super consciousness. Um, yeah, all oh, wonderful things. There's lots of things that, that I could, we could go into there with etern eternality and time is an illusion and different dimensions, which are all kind of areas that I love to talk about. But um, yeah, yeah I, 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 what I want to touch on, because I, I saw in, in the notes again that, that Gavin sent me, your publicist sent me, there's so much, again, people will look, sometimes look at people like yourself and myself and, and say, we're, we're not being rational, we're not, we're not being realistic. But science, I look at, I actually have this vision of scientists coming up the mountain and they get to the top and there's the philosophers and the theologians sitting there going, we told you guys this like a thousand years ago because we're starting to come back around to it with things like quantum mechanics and the idea that time is an illusion. I mean, Einstein even talked about that. It's, you know, he, he envisioned the universe as everything is happening at once or, or everything has always already happened, however you want to view it. And we just kind of go through it with this different perspective. So uh, I noticed one of the notes you had in was future science and the science of spirituality. I love that term, the science of spirituality. Yeah, um, because it is, it's where quantum physics starts meeting science. And, um, you know, we can just to talk about the rational, going back into the rational mind and the intuitive mind, you could look at that, say, in a spiritual way. And you could say the, the sixth chakra or the third eye is really to do, okay, it's to do with um, seeing, but it's mm -hmm. also the rational mind. But we need to jump beyond that into the crown chakra, which opens up to the higher mind. So you could look at it that way, or you mm -hmm. can look at it with science. So um, I think there's a project out at the moment called, the, well, a piece of scientific study that came out recently called the Blue, I think it's called the Blue Brain Project. And this is scientists leading edge, and they've discovered that within our minds, we have multi-dimensional geometries going on mm. in wow. our minds. And you go, yeah. okay, well, why is that? Why do we have multi-dimensional geometries going? And it's because we do, we are able to go beyond uh, time and space. So look, you were talking earlier about uh, past life regression. When you go into a past life regression, you're going back in time to another life. Mm -hmm. And how's that possible? You know, unless time is an illusion. So one of the ways I used to try and explain that um, to people is when you, I know we've kind of we all stream things off Netflix these days. But for those of you who remember DVDs or even just uh, flash drives with 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 films on, the entire film is on there, isn't it? Beginning, mm -hmm. middle, and end. The whole thing's on there. Mm -hmm. And but we have to watch it through time and space. We have to watch it from the beginning, two hours of film to the end to get the whole story. But yet it's all there. And it's, I think that's a, a kind of analogy we could use for, for time and illusion in the mind, that it's all there. Your past life is there, your, you know, our present life is there. And it's all happening at once, but it would drive us bonkers if that happened. So it's veiled from us. So yeah. we don't see that, but we're actually able to tap into different times and spaces. And then what you reveal in that past life or heal in that past life actually affects you in the present, which then affects the future going forward. So it's not just a DVD, it's like an interactive DVD that you can yeah. reprogram. Um, so I find that fascinating. And the other scientific use, I think, of looking at the this thing of, a, you know, a um, multidimensionality and also uh, this higher mind is when we talk about remote viewing. So mm. remote viewing is something that's very scientific. It was, um, there's a book by Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher, which you know, if you want to read it, good luck with it because it's extremely um, scientific. And it's called Mind Dynamics in Space, which was written by her and Dr. Hertak. And it talks about um, their experiments with a guy called Russell Tarker, I think it was at MIT, where mm -hmm. they were remote viewed. And they put, they had these three guys that were really brilliant at doing it. And they put them in a room and they give them some say, co coordinates somewhere. And they'd go and they you know, they'd be in an office somewhere and they'd be able to read the files in the filing cabinet or they'd be able to draw what something looked like um, 
in another top, in another part of the world or then they've discovered that sometimes they draw something that wasn't there and then they go and investigate and find out that thing that they drew that wasn't there used to be there in the 1930s or something like that so mm -hmm. you think how is this possible so there's so much more and so yeah i'm really fascinated by the science of spirituality because i think it is then bringing together the rational mind and the intuitive mind so because you see, people can think we're a bit woo woo, can't they? Oh, we're a bit airy fairy, you know. And, you know, if we talk about sort of angels, say, or angelics, or the divine, or past life experiences, or near death experiences, it's, it's sometimes too much for people to take on board. And that's because of cognitive dissonance. They've got a belief that's very inculcated in them that, that, that this, all these things don't exist. And you're giving them evidence that it does. And it, they can't equate the two. So they'll reject it. And they reject it out of fear because yeah. it would have to mean that they'd have to unpick what they believe. Um, so you have to be gentle with people and those who have ears to hear will hear. Um, but I think there's a rising and there's an awakening going on and more and more people are coming into this space. So it's really nice to also be able to look at the science of spirituality uh, and look at what's happening in quantum physics, what's happening with the Blue Brain Project, what's happening with multidimensional geometries in our mind and that all these dimensions. There's some fabulous mathematicians at the moment who are saying, the, the, un, the physical world creation is so perfect, it had to come from a divine mind. Because oh, there's, there's a perfection in the geometries, in the numbers, in the mathematics. And there's one guy, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he just sees the whole world as just this perfect mathematics and logarithms. And, mm -hmm. and that's mind blowing. So it's wonderful to be able to go full circle, if you like, with, you know, we've got the science this side and the spirituality that side, and it kind of goes full circle and touches. And I find that really um, fascinating to delve into. Well, you know, what I find interesting is we as, a, as mankind have such a short memory. So we think that we've been materialists forever. You know, we've been and we've been materialistic atheists, which is kind of the dominant mindset of the day. But for most of mankind's history, we've been very spiritual. We've been we've been tapped into these things and we've taken them for granted. And I find it interesting because us woo woo people, a lot of us are turning now back to old practices, you know, shamanism and yoga and, you know, studying these things that have been around for, for thousands of years. Um, because we've, I, the way I look at, it, we've kind of lost our way, and and we've we've come into this mindset that says, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if uh, if I can't test it in a lab, that it, it can't be real. Uh, whereas that's a very that's a very modern mindset that we've only had for a little while, and, but we're all you know some of us are like so excited. Oh, science is going to prove this now. Whereas these are things we've taken for granted for most of our existence. So again, as a scientist, even myself, I'm excited when we can prove it, but I'm not waiting around for them to prove it because there's just way, way too much evidence. And, you know, I, I was talking to someone and they're like, there's no evidence for any of this. And I said, okay, let me give you a couple of things to read. Go look up Dr. Gary Schwartz and his research on mediums and go look up Dr. Julie Beischel and her research on mediums. And then get back to me because they've written peer review papers that have shown that mediumship is at least tapping into consciousness that we can't understand. And the guy comes back to me after about 15 minutes and goes, oh, this is talking about mediums. Mediumship isn't real. Therefore, I'm not going to bother reading it. And I'm like, that is not a scientific approach. A scientist would examine the evidence. And when you examine the evidence, there's just tons of it out there. There's, there's so much. And you've touched on some. I've touched on some. So when people... You know, call us woo woo or say you're wishful thinking. I I just kind of I just kind of snicker, and I'm um, and I've told people you know I I will give you reasons to why I believe what I do if you want to hear them, um, but you're right. Most a lot of people just aren't open to it yet. They're just they're caught up in this this paradigm that we've we've fallen into, which I believe is the root. You talk about the root of all evil. It's the idea that we've forgotten who we are. Absolutely, yeah, completely. Um, I think it's sort of probably come from um, things like the Renaissance period and then the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. um, and then it's sort of pushed us into that very, very rational mind. But um, it, we, we are rediscovering ancient wisdom for a modern world, aren't we? And I think mm -hmm. we can also look to the indigenous cultures because they carry um, these sort of like wisdom teachings with them. And we can learn a lot from that. And again, something else that people dismiss, but um, I think, you know, they probably laugh at, uh, laugh at the Western society in the way that we, we live. Um, so there's a lot of wisdom there. And I think mm -hmm. people need to just be open and curious. You know, like you were talking about the books that you recommended. 
it's just about going, okay, well, I don't believe in mediumship, but I'm just going to be open and curious and read this book anyway. And then yeah. I'll make a decision at the end, you know, yeah. rather than shutting it down before it's given it a chance. Well, it's interesting you say that because people will call themselves skeptics when they're really cynics. And the difference is a skeptic is slow to come to conclusions, but they'll examine the evidence. And so speaking, that, I have another friend, Stotch, her, her actual job was to disprove things. She was a debunker. And she and I became friends on Facebook. And she came to me. She said, I know that mediumship's not real. I don't believe any of it. Tell me the best medium you know. And I'm going to go to her and I'm going to prove that it's not real. I'm going to give her a fake name. I'm going to pay through a third party. And I'm going to prove it's not real. She comes back to me. I gave her the name of my friend. And she's like, wow, she blew me away. <laughs> and she is a true believer now. And it's funny because I, she even said the other day, she said, I said there was no evidence for any of this out there. And she goes, there is so much evidence, but people don't know it. You know, they don't know all the research. They don't know that the government did research on remote viewing. You know, they don't know all the experiments that have been done on Psy. I mean, Psy has been proven in the lab over and over and over again. They can't mm. explain how it works, but they know that it works. That people do have psychic abilities. Um, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Reichel, you know, they've shown that mediumship that mediums can get information about deceased people that there's no rational way that they would know. These things are just, they're facts. They're not opinions. They're not, they're not wishful thinking. Yeah, they're absolutely facts. And I think this is really what inspired me to write Red Dress because a lot of people won't go and read those kinds of books. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this fabulous, obviously there's some fabulous, fabulous books out there, but you've got to have the motivation to read them. Um, so what I wanted to do was put some of this into a fun novel so people could just like go on holiday and sit on the beach and read their fun novel. And, the, you know, the woman in there has, you know, ends up having an affair and there's all kinds, and she's stressed out and there's all these things but there's all these learnings as well and it's interesting what you said about you know people the, your friend and the, uh, the 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 medium there's there's a scene in the book where um there's a, a love interest that she has ends up going along with her the main central character katie to have his mm -hmm. soul contract read and he thinks it's a load of old rubbish and he's hoping that nobody spots him going going on you know it's like oh nobody sees me doing this and he goes in to have his soul contract read and he just thinks oh well i'll get this over and done with just to please her and then this, the, the lady that's doing the soul contract starts talking to him and she starts telling him about his past and he's like his jaw is dropping because he's going how could you know that how could you know that and she she's kind of put a been searching me you know she's 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 tagged she's she's tapped me or something so mm -hmm. um so i just wanted to kind of uh show that as well within the different characters that um there are there are characters in there that think that the central character is going mad and is woo woo and then she has to find her niche and find her her soul family if you like and there's a lot of that kind of um there's there's a lot of things like that where people don't believe things and then they get shocked when they when they see it. So I hope people take that to heart when they read it, because this is what yeah. I wanted to do is to kind of get that out there in an easy, enjoyable, lighthearted, entertaining way rather than somebody having to plow through fabulous book. But you have to have the motivation and want to plow through some of those books, which for you and I are great because we love it, but not everybody does. So well, yeah. we get people to get their toes into that world. It's funny because I read a lot, but I hardly ever read fiction because I just don't have time. There's just so much other things, that, you know, because I'm basically researching all the time. Um, but for other people, as you said, they don't they don't have that that mindset or that motivation. And frankly, some of the stuff is boring and some of it's hard to understand. So let's talk about how you weave these these themes into the red dress into red dress. So how do, how do you weave these things in? Well, um, I get the central character. The central character, I think a lot of women will relate to her. She's in her 40s. She's got two teenage children and her marriage isn't great. And the guy that she's married to is a bit of a power hungry, probably narcissist, possibly slightly psychopathic, but he's definitely dysfunctional. Um, she's trying to hold it all together and she's a therapist mm -hmm. and she's lost herself. And, you know, uh, I know a lot of your work is about grieving and I think grieving sometimes is about somebody dear to you that you've lost it, it, and it's this intense sadness. Sometimes you can grieve about the loss of yourself or who you are or a life you had um, and that can sometimes be a kickstart into a spiritual journey and really that's what happens to her. So 
The fact that she's lost an empty and she feels guilty that she's lost an empty because she's actually got a successful life mm -hmm. materialistically. Right. She's got a nice house in West London, you know, she's, she's successful. But she just feels there's something more. She feels lost, she feels empty, she feels quite depressed. And because she's a therapist, she has the courage to go for therapy. Now, I think it does take courage to say, I'm going to go get some help. I think it just takes enormous courage to do that. And that's what she does. And she, she, she's, because she's a therapist, she has a supervisor and she says, can you give me some sessions? I think I need to explore some things. Mm -hmm. So through the sessions, and they're not too long and boring, through those sessions that she has periodically throughout the book with her therapist, we get to understand some of the workings of her mind and what's going on but she also embarks on this spiritual journey because she she's a reiki he, she's a reiki master she mm. meditates and she's um got these parallel paths of being the, the, the kind of the, the the rational psychotherapist and the and the intuitive healer mm -hmm. and she's trying to keep them apart and eventually they actually come together these parallel mm -hmm. paths come together but so we can follow her so she's she's um an interesting character and she's sort of funny so she she's she's not she's herself is not sure about this spiritual journey so she's almost criticizing herself as she goes and going oh well, this is just a load of rubbish i've just wasted all this money on this thing and it can't be real you know and so she's questioning herself all the way which is of course what a lot of people do mm -hmm. um so because of that she gets led on intuitively to all kinds of things so um the, the, she actually i'm probably not giving too much away by saying right yeah. near the beginning of the book <laughs> She hands over to God and she doesn't even really believe in God because she's not religious, she's spiritual. But mm -hmm. she decides that God is om, you know, omnipotent, omnipotent, om, om, omniscient, omnipotent, <laughs> all-knowing, all-powerful uh, mm -hmm. and everywhere. And so she's just, she has this kind of moment where she giggles and she goes, oh, that means he knows that I'm thinking about him. <laughs> you know? and then, she, then she ends up in this spur of the moment because uh, she's so fed up with her life, just handing it over to God. She, she does it almost as a joke. She's kind of going, let's see what happens, let's see if he exists, let's see if anything happens. And that sets in motion a whole series of mm -hmm. events um, mm -hmm. which take her through this journey of awakening to who she really is, what's really true for her. Um, she's really lost sight of herself um, and she starts finding herself and she starts finding like-minded friends and she starts going on um, reading spiritual books under, learning about Tesla, learning about um, vibrations and frequencies and chakras, and um, she has a soul reading, and um, and yeah, she she goes on a journey. And in fact, it's the first of a trilogy of books. So that trilogy will follow her. The first one is really, and this is I think how people change. So the first book, Red Dress, is about her waking up, becoming mm -hmm. aware, becoming mm -hmm. conscious, saying, mm -hmm. "Hang on a minute, there's more to life than this. My life's not working." She then starts to go on a, on a journey of, of self-awareness and self-discovery. And through that journey, she's learning and she actually ends up, there's a, there's a voice that's talking to her. And I never quite say what the voice is. It could be God, it could be the divine, it could be her God. I never say it's just the voice. But the mm -hmm. voice is giving her all this amazing wisdom, like, you know, you can choose your thoughts and your thoughts and feelings create your reality. And so it's giving her all these wisdom when she has mm. these moments with the voice, which, you know, are peppered throughout the book. So the first... So Red Dress is really about her becoming aware, becoming awake, dipping her toe into this journey, which she does with some trepidation because she thinks everybody else is going to laugh at her and thinks she's woo-woo and she's worried about other people judging her. But it's really about um, letting go of the structure of her life that's held her in this place or taken her to where she is, which hasn't worked. And it's that thing, the ladder's against the wrong wall. She's climbed the ladder and she's found it's against the wrong wall. It's not the life she wanted. It's not what she thought it would be. So she's got to dismantle that. So the whole mm -hmm. of the first book, Red Dress, is about dismantling that and becoming aware and awake and deciding to go on this spiritual journey. And then the second book, which I'm kind of like about a third of the way through writing, mm -hmm. is about um, old structures completely crashing down around her and then her going further into her self-healing and rising like a phoenix from the ashes as a very strong person within herself 
who believes in herself and who's mm. found who she is and what matters to her. Because I think that's what we all must do, find out what are we passionate about, what matters to us, what do we love doing, what lifts us, what feeds us. And that's what she does in the, in the, in the sequel to Red Dress. And then in the, the third book will be really her stepping into her power and authority and doing what she's come to do in the world. Awesome. So it's a, it's a whole kind of transition thing. So, um, yeah, and there's lots of stuff in there, like, you know, her going on holiday with her kids and walking and going to the pub and eating food. And she's a wine expert and she's a food buff and she loves dark chocolate and she can't stop eating chocolate from the fridge. And <laughs> she's very human, you know, she drives too fast and gets a speeding fine. And, and, and then she's got a little guide that tells her to slow down and then she slows down just in time for the, you know, the speed camera and she doesn't yeah. get the ticket. And there's, there's stuff, there's a, there's a whole scene where she's listening to Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now in her car while she's driving somewhere and she's thinking about what she's going to have for supper and she's got to go and what she's going to give the kids and did she need the gas you know all, all things that people do and she's right, not listening right. Eckhart Tolle's droning on in the background about the power of now <laughs> and then she finally she finally goes into the now and what happens is she's caught by the beauty of the trees in the mist overhanging the English countryside as she's driving and mm. she just looks at it and she's arrested by the beauty of it and in doing so, she overshoots her turning and then she has to kind of career off the off the highway and all these people are beeping her. And <laughs> so it's very, very human and funny and lighthearted. But if you want to, you can take it at a deeper level. So that's how I've unfolded that journey within a novel. Yeah, that so, sounds uh, awesome. I, you, you know, you use a phrase that I've never heard before, the ladder against the wrong wall. I like that. Um, it's interesting. I've because... stolen it from someone. And I can't remember who it is, but <laughs> that, um, one of the sort of motivation people um, Forgive me. I, I don't know whether it's COVID I, I thought it was, or I thought or it was something. a British thing, so you could you could have taken credit for it. But, oh uh, well, I wouldn't do that if it wasn't mine. But I just I do love the analogy because that's what so many people do, isn't it? They climb yeah. they, they climb the ladder and then they get there and they go oh. Yeah, it, it, and I like the fact that, that again a little bit different because you know it's kind of like your life. She she's living a good life, you know, but she's awakened just by. You know, it's just like, this is just not, this is not everything. Some of us need a knock over the head. Some of us can do it with a more a gentle nudge. Uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but before we, we close, I want to ask you about the bone circle. Tell me about what the bone circle is. Oh my goodness. I think we're going to need a whole new session for the bone circle because it's huge. Um, it's actually quite difficult to describe what it is, um, but it's an entire transformative training. And some of the things we've talked about today around consciousness and around becoming self-aware are included in that bone circle. So it starts with the premise or the truth bomb that, I'm, that I would call it, mm -hmm. um, that we are all powerful creators and mm. we, we create whether we're conscious of it or not. So either we create misery for ourselves and everything we don't want, or we choose, that goes back to choice, choose to create what we do want. But a lot of people don't know what they do want. Their ladder's against the wrong wall, but they don't know actually which wall they want to be against. They've got mm. no clue because they're so stuck and trapped in what society expects of them that they have no idea. So it works a lot with, we don't work a lot with intuition to train people to actually train people to use their intuition at will, mm. to be able to see their truth Mm. and to then be able to bring that to life. So there's a lot of work around creating how we create. So we can either be in the what I call the reactive or responsive orientation, where we're reacting and responding to things that are happening. So we're reacting to, I'm late for work or what, I'm stuck in traffic or whatever's going on externally, or what's going on internally. Oh, I'm afraid or I'm angry or whatever. Mm. So and we react to those things and respond to those things because we're in that small self. So it's about under, so this part of the bone circle is about understanding that and understanding how that small self plays out and what it does and what your beliefs are and what your Enneagram is and what it does and what your patterns are so that you can become aware of them and then make a choice to be in the creative orientation, which is where you're not trying to fix problems. You're not trying to respond to what's going on. You're choosing to create something. Now that mm. could a thing like a book or a podcast or a website or it could be a relationship a good relationship or mm -hmm. it could be stillness or a practice of meditation mm -hmm. or something like that so it's about just going for end results and visions which are true for you for, at soul level so it's really understanding your soul purpose what you come here for what you love doing and the purpose isn't some great big thing it's probably mm -hmm. something you've always done because you love it and you haven't realized that so it's, it's an awakening 
um, the bone circle is an awakening. It, the reason it's called bone circle as well is because it is a circle, so people help and support each other. Because it goes back to that African proverb: if you want to go fast, go alone; if you want to go far, go together. So we go together, so that you've got a whole load of people supporting you. Because it's extremely difficult to pull out of that conditioning and do things that your little self is screaming at you: you can't do it. Right, you know, who right. do you think you are writing a book? You know, so you have. Your, your, this whole sort of fellowship or sisterhood that is helping you through that, which I think is so important. We need to all support each other and help each other because we are all connected. So together we rise. And this is how, you know, together we're powerful and it's time, it's time now at this time. So Bone Circle is partly about creating and intuition and soul purpose. It's partly about a little bit of therapy stuff that I give people if they need to unhook stuff from the past, process trauma, get, you know, be free of things. Um, and also a little bit of metaphysical and spiritual stuff around things like, you know, eat well, drink water, you know, <laughs> exercise, spend time in nature, meditate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and all of those things. And I also bring in, I really love working with sacred names and sacred chants because they carry like the most incredible vibration. We're talking about vibration and um, Tesla and those and sacred names and sacred chants, whatever language they're in, carry just the most beautiful and sublime vibration. And when you work with those, it raises your vibration. And you can use them for protection. You can use them for guidance. You can call, I mean, a lot of people call upon Archangel Michael, for example, to protect them if they're going into hospital right now or if they're going anywhere. You know, and we can, we, these are real, uh, I would say they're mind forces. They're, they're huge collective mind forces. But if we want to see them as an angel with wings, that's fine because that's how we understand it. Right. Um, but we can also call upon the divine and call upon these names and work with those and that will shift our energy and shift our perspective and shift our consciousness open it so it's a kind of a combination of all of those but the entire training works on these sets of truth bombs okay. about life yeah which so is kind of I, I, i'm sorry we, we actually we probably are running out of time um i could talk to you all day we got through about half of what i wanted to cover um so what i want to do is give you a chance how can people find out more about you, more about what you do. Uh, how can people reach you? Um, best place to reach me is on my website, which is www.bridgetfinclair.com. And Bridget Finclair is B-R-I-D-G-E-T. So it's like bridge with a T on the end, B-R-I-D-G-E-T, F for Freddy, I-N-K-L-A-I-R-E. It's an unusual name. So I'm the only one. This, I think my family are the only Finclairs in the world. So you will find me, BridgetFinclair.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on, I've got an author page on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't remember that name, John Hunt, JohnHuntPublishing.com is my publisher. And they're probably easier to remember. And you should be able to find them from there. The dress, the, the book is Red Dress, the training is The Bone Circle, and it's all there on my website. I think that's the best place to get me. Awesome. Awesome. And I will definitely put links to both in, in the in the show notes so people can see it there. And I'll put it in the in the YouTube notes also. Uh, Bridget, Thank you. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and, and having this conversation. I, I, I wish we had a couple of hours to talk, but if you want, I'll definitely like to have you back to continue. We can talk more about The Bone Circle and other things we didn't get to. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me as your guest. I have so enjoyed it. It's been brilliant, brilliant to meet you, Brian. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you again because I think we could we could easily fill another hour. We've got so oh, much in common. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> have a great rest of your day. And you. So that does it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you enjoyed it. If you like this content, make sure you subscribe. So click on the subscribe button here and then click on the bell to receive notifications and click on all. That way you'll be notified whenever I release new content. Thanks for watching and have a great day.